lost my camel back on a recent trip, so I've got a screen you can't see. But how many pastors do you know have a pirate water bottle? Thank you. <laughs> so this will be a little bit of a different survey than I normally give, and it is going to involve a couple of big words, and as usual, may or may not include questions that congregation which you're welcome to answer. We're seeing silence, as I know many of you like to do. Um, we're going to start with a big word. Because some of you, not as others of you, it's called hermeneutic. Say it with me. Hermeneutic. It's a big word, but it's pretty easy. It means what we do when we find things uh, that contradict each other, or let's be honest, that we simply don't like in a text like the Bible. How is it that we interpret or figure out where the truth in the Bible is? And that's what hermeneutic is. And uh, many of us in this congregation, at least a few of us, I won't name names, but you know who you are. And boy, we call it hermeneutic of suspicion, saying, I'm a little dubious that things like this happen exactly the way they said. We're not going to name that, but we know who it is. <laughs> uh, but there are other hermeneutics herm herm we can choose as well. And we're going to get into that as soon as we talk about this idea of biblical marriage. So we had a great story a few weeks ago. We had the story of Isaac and Rebecca. And I'd love to tell that story because you don't really expect it. And that story, for those of you who are here, or the one or two of you who may have forgotten the salient details of my sermon, involved Rebecca uh, being chosen because the servant of Abraham was out tasked to find a wife for Isaac. He said, I will choose as Isaac's wife the woman who offers to water my camel. <laughs> and as we talked about that, camels drink a lot of water. And so if there's a woman carrying a bunch of water, well to the camels until they are no longer thirsty. This is a very strong and powerful woman. And furthermore, in that story, it's explicit to the servant. Only take her if she agrees to come. If she agrees to come. Not if the father says it's okay for her to come, but if she agrees to come. So the story of Isaac and Rebecca, we had the evidence that there was choice that was the foundation of Isaac's love. And so luckily that theme has continued to today. Story. Uh, so, right, we've got a different story today, don't we? It's a little different kind of marriage. It's a little bit different kind, certainly, of wedding ceremony. Because instead today, we have the story that Laban first demands the dowry of seven years of labor from Jacob. Now, part of this is that, if you recall, Isaac showed up here, Rebecca, with all his camels and a bunch of fancy jewelry to give us a dowry. And so we presume that Jacob has shown up with not quite as much, since he is, after all, a refugee from his homeland, being driven out by his brother Esau. So Jacob probably didn't have very much to offer at that particular moment. And Laban said, well, I can't give her to you for free. You need to work for me. So that's the first element that's different. We don't know really what Rachel is saying, although Rachel also turns out on well, Jacob. But it's a little bit different story, because it's about what Laban wants. So that's a different story than Isaac and Rebecca. And it is continues to be different because what happens on the wedding night? Jacob's fulfilled the terms of his bargain, and what happens? Laban yeah. tricks him. Yeah. And we sort of are led in our modern times to sort of question a little bit Jacob, especially since, at least in this translation, we see, well, Rachel has supposedly had a more figure. Okay, how did you not notice? Um, but, but we won't go there right now. Um, we'll just leave that in your mind to fester a little bit. Uh, but no, he was tricked. Now, if we look at the Bible, the collection of stories that are told for reasons, and I was reading Walter Brueggemann this week, who is a famous theologian uh, that tends to be popular with UCC, and he points out there's a little bit of humor in this story. And part of that humor is that Jacob is the trickster. Right? Jacob is the con man. He's the one that tricked Esau. He, along with his mother, tricked his father into giving up Esau's birthright to the man of Jacob. And so he walks into Laban's camp, not expecting that Laban, it turns out, is a better trickster than he is. And so this is a little bit of irony 
reconcile that. Do we think Jacob should have loved her? Do we think Leah's unrequited love for Jacob was enough? I don't think so. I think we need to reconcile these and say, you know what? We have no choice but to think that God loves us. This is the story that Jesus Christ tells us, that God loves us so much that he sent his only son into the world for us. That God loves us so much that Jesus showed us the way
this in this case, in this story, we do have a love story. Rachel did love Jacob. Jacob did love Rachel. So there was joy in that, and there was love. At the same time, Laban loved both of his daughters. And he did not want to humiliate Mia by having Rachel marry first. He did not want to make it clear to the world there was something wrong with Mia and gave her marriage. Did Laban make the right choice? I, I don't know. Trapping her in a loveless marriage is not a great choice, but it's something that he was trying to do out of love. And I say that, oh my, am I glad now that it's okay to get married before my older siblings? Anyone else? You're glad that you didn't have to wait for some sibling to be married before you did? Wow, that was an annoying. My brother, 42, or 40 before he got married. It's crazy. It's okay to just have a good wait forever. So that's the joy. It's not the same culture. It's not the same time. The rules that govern David's actions do not govern our actions. But what does is God's love. That in our own world, we have choices to make. We've got opportunity to make choices that bring love to someone's life or don't bring love to someone's life. We have choices we can make to say, am I showing God's love in this world? Do they know what I am doing? Do they know that I love them? And this is the reason that I am doing this thing. And furthermore, is it going to cause them pain? If so, is it the right choice? This is the message of Jesus Christ. He said throughout his ministry, we have all these people around us who know all of the rules, who know all of the traditions, who know how everything is, and they know it so well, they miss what's in front of their face. They're so attached to their traditions that they do not see their job is to love and to hope. They do not see that the traditions are grounded in, a, in the basis of fear and of despair and of the worry of death. And that is the gift that Jesus gives us. We have the choice to live seeing the world through the hermeneutic of love. Are these people doing things because they love us? Do we love them or are we afraid that they hate us? Are we afraid that the people in our lives are seeking to do what's ill? We have the choice of how to live in love or hate. And in this story, that every week I say the story of our creation is the story of God's love for each and every one of us, not because we did anything to deserve it, but because we were all worthy in the eyes of God to be loved children of God, and that it was for us. Jacob 